times that we're living in, one of the things I love about prophecy is it contextualizes what's happening in the world. In other words, this is a very troubling time in the world. Yes. And Jesus said everything that was going to happen, earthquakes, wars, rumors of wars, pestilence, all those things. And he said, when you see these things begin to happen, look up, lift up your head, your redemption's drawing near. And so there are some very troubling things that are happening in the world that I want to talk about. And these things that are happening, when you contextualize those within prophecy, it gives you hope. You don't get discouraged. You don't get confused. You have hope. And so a lot of people are going to get hope. And this is something I was telling Joni earlier. I've been studying Bible prophecy for 44 years. Wow. And this is, uh, I believe that this moment here with you guys is a real fulfillment of even the reason I've been studying prophecy because there are some things happening that are unprecedented. And I got to tell you this, in 1973, 44 years ago, that's when I first started preaching. I was 15 years old, so 44 years, that's I coming say. up on 45, that's when I just like say. you. Isn't that cool? Yeah, there you go. How about there that? You go. Well, I want to talk about this year, and I want to say a couple of things. As a, as a person who studies Bible prophecy, there's a balance. And the first thing I don't ever want to do is exaggerate. I don't want to manipulate people. I don't want to manipulate facts. You know, because sometimes when you talk about end time prophecy, things get said that are just so exaggerated. The other thing I don't want to do is miss God. Now we have to remember the Jews missed their Messiah, yes. even though it was prophesied about hundreds of times in the Old Testament because they discounted many of the things that were said. They just missed it. And so I don't want to miss anything and I don't want to make anything up. But the things that I want to talk about, four specific things that I want to talk about that make this year a very, very interesting year. And I think very uh, significant prophetically. And I want to say right up front now, I am not predicting the time of the rapture. I'm not predicting anything through what I'm saying. I'm only talking about things that are true and the fact that they're true this year. They're true right now. And this could be a very significant year. And four things, first of it is, this is the year, Hebrew year 5777. The oh, Bible, wow. the Bible is a book of sevens. From the, God made a, a week, a, a day, a, a week of seven days that he created the earth. In the book of, that was Genesis. If you go to the book of Revelation, seven seals, seven bowls, seven trumpets, all, all the sevens, and the reason that the sevens are in the book of Revelation is God's finishing everything in the book of Revelation. And seven years for the tribulation. That's right. And, and God created the world in six days, and on the seventh day he That's rested. Right. That's right. So this is the year 5777, but it changes this time next week. We're in the last week of the year 5777, because next Wednesday, which I believe is September the 20th, begins the Feast of Trumpets. The Feast of Trumpets is the new year, the civil new year for Israel. And so 5777 becomes 5778 next Wednesday. Next Wednesday and Thursday are the Feast of Trumpets. It will be another thousand years until there would be another 777. So the question is, is the Hebrew year 5777 significant to God in the sense that he orchestrated this to give us a sign that everything was complete? That this is the completion of all things. But let me say this, and I don't know. I don't know. We'll see. But here's what I do know, and I do believe very strongly. Jesus will return for the church. The rapture, I believe, will happen on the Feast of Trumpets some year. Now, when the Bible, when, when God told the children of Israel to have feasts, there were seven feasts. And we know this is a prophetic grid. In Leviticus 23, when God was giving the children of Israel the feast, the first four feasts were literally fulfilled in the coming of Jesus and the coming of the Holy Spirit. Yes. So in other words, God said, have Passover. That was the first feast. That was Jesus was crucified on Passover. The feast of unleavened bread. Jesus was buried on unleavened bread. The Feast of First Fruits, Jesus was resurrected on the Feast of First Fruits. And 50 days later was the Feast of Pentecost. The Holy Spirit fell on the upper room right over there, over your shoulder, 
on the Feast of Pentecost. So they happen sequentially. The first one, the second one, the third one, the fourth one. There are seven feasts. There are four in the spring, three in the fall. And there's no way that could be coincidence. Absolutely no way. So in other words, in the Old Testament, when God said, I want you to have a holy convocation, all the people come together, that means dress rehearsal. See, when they were having Passover in the Old Testament, it was a dress rehearsal for the crucifixion. When they were having the feast of, of the, the, the unleavened bread, it was a dress rehearsal for the burial of Jesus. Everything was a dress rehearsal until the real thing came. And remember, when Jesus was being crucified, the priests were in the temple taking the lamb, the spotless lamb that they had selected for Passover. And so everything was a, was a dress rehearsal. So in other words, the next three feasts, at some point in time, there's not going to be a dress rehearsal. The real thing's going to happen. And the, the three feasts in the fall of the year, the first one is the Feast of Trumpets. It's a two-day feast. And that's very significant because I believe that Jesus will rapture the church at the Feast of the Trumpets some year. Now, the significant thing, Jesus said, no man knows the day or the hour. He's talking about his return. If I told you that Jesus was coming on the Feast of Trumpets, you still don't know the day or the hour because it's a two-day feast. You know, Jesus didn't say we wouldn't know the season. Uh, 1 Thessalonians right. 5 says, this day should not overtake you as a thief because you're children of light. And so when the Bible says that Jesus comes as a thief, that's talking about unbelievers. For those of us who are believers, we have been given incredible amounts of Bible prophecy and information to help us prepare for that day. And Jesus said, watch, you be ready for that day. So I believe some year Jesus, the rapture is going to happen because 1 Corinthians 15 says at the last trump, we will all be changed in the twinkling of an eye. The corruption will put on incorruption. The mortal will put on immortality at the last trumpet. Now, the Feast of Trumpets, uh, this is when the Jews believed that God created Adam and Eve. So literally, the, the Feast of Trumpets is happy birthday to the world. Okay, mm -hmm. So they believe that this is a, the, it's the changing of the year, the civil year. So this time next week, it'll be 5778. But the priests blow the shofar. 100 times. We got one right here on the table. There it is There's right the there. Shofar. So they take the shofar and they blow it 100 times. Nine times they do 11 blasts. So they'll take the shofar and go 11 blasts, nine times, that makes 99. And then they blow it one last time. It's called the last trumpet. And at that last trumpet, that's what 1 Corinthians 15 says, at the last trumpet, we will be changed. So I believe that Jesus will return. This is a private event. The second coming is a public event. But, the, but uh, when Jesus talked about the rapture, by the way, he was always talking in terms about like the days of Noah, like the days of Lot. There was buying, selling, marrying, and giving in marriage. In Luke 17, he says, on the day that Lot went out, the fire and brimstone fell and destroyed them all. On the day that Lot went out, so it will be also in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. And I hear people sometimes saying, well, we're not going to go through the tribulation. By the way, in Luke 17, Jesus exactly describes the rapture. Two people will be in bed, one taken, one left. Two people standing in a field, one taken, one left. In other words, he's talking about a selective rapture where God comes to the world and knows who belongs to him. Wow. And he takes away, the word is called harpazo, and it means to seize hastily. He takes away those that are his, the rest remain during the tribulation period of time. So I believe that some Feast of Trumpets, uh, imminency is a very important doctrine in the return of Christ because we yes. won't know. Jesus said it will come as a snare on all of those who dwell on the face of the whole earth. You cannot get a more inclusive statement than that. Every single person on earth is going to be ensnared just like that. Jesus said they will not escape. In other words, Jesus told us to pray Pray that you would be worthy to escape all of these things and to stand before the Son of Man. Yes. So when you receive Christ, when you make Jesus Lord of your life, you have prepared yourself to be taken up in the rapture and to escape. I'm not an escapist. I'm just praying what Jesus told me to pray. So I believe that Jesus will come at the Feast of Trumpets. It will no longer be a dress rehearsal. There is going to be a year, and this could be the year, this time next week. Seven days from now, hmm. the Feast of Trumpets happens for two days. 
And I believe that that could be because it's 5777 and other significant things that I'll talk about. And by the way, when trumpets happens, the next 10 days are called days of awe or days of affliction. And after 10 days is the Feast of Atonement. And atonement is a time of fasting. It's a time of repentance. Yes. I believe that speaks of the fulfillment of Israel. When God comes and purifies Israel and Israel gets saved in one day, what the Bible says in Zechariah, then five days after that is the Feast of Booths or the Feast of Tabernacles. And that is for seven days, the Jewish people will take palm branches. They'll make booths outside or up on their roofs or something. And it commemorates eternity with God that we live eternally with God. So the next three feasts will be the rapture of the church, the fulfillment of Israel, and we spend eternity with God. Wow. And that finishes all seven feasts because the seven feasts tell us the future in advance. And that's what's happening. So we're living this time next week. Uh, the year will change to 5778, and the Feast of Trumpets will happen. And I'm going to be ready. And I don't know that Jesus is coming. But I'm telling you one thing, every year when the Feast of Trumpets comes, I'm ready for Jesus. Okay, since we're talking about these dates, we know that um, the Bible says, this generation shall not pass away till all these things be fulfilled. And most people believe is talking about the generation that sees the rebirthing of the nation of Israel. Israel became a sovereign country again for the first time in almost 2,000 years in May 1948. And so most people believe that a generation, you know, what's promised to man is 70 years. So 70 plus 1948 would be the year 2018. So could it be, we're not saying that it is, but could it be that somewhere between now and the end of 2018, that Jesus could return right here over my shoulder to the yes. Mount of Olives? Uh, I believe that we're living at the end of the end times. I believe that everything the Bible said would happen is happening. And I believe that the return of Jesus is imminent. I really do. Let me say this. Some of you have heard me say this before, and I will be very brief about this. But it was in March of 1983 when Joni and I came to the Holy Land for the very first time. We'd only been married seven months. And right there on the Mount of Olives, that's when the Lord first spoke to me to get into Christian television. He said, go to Montgomery, Alabama and build the first Christian TV station in the history of the state of Alabama. And how amazing. See, he who knows the end from the beginning, that he called me and Joni into Christian television right here in Israel, knowing that one day he would open up the door for the nation of Israel to grant Daystar a license to be on in all of the homes in Israel. That has never happened before or since for a full-time Christian channel. And then to also think about what you just said, Jimmy. So he, he spoke to me there on the Mount of Olives, and that's where he's going to come back. That's right. And, uh, and when the, the Mount of Olives, the Bible says it's going to split right. at his coming when he steps on. Is that right? That's right. And he's going to set up his millennial throne here on the, the Temple Mount right behind us and rule for a thousand years. Okay, I know there's a lot of things we want to talk about. So I want to ask you about somebody that's very famous in history, yet the average Christian does not know of him. And his name is Judah Ben Samuel. Yes. Who was Judah Ben Samuel and why is he significant? Very famous rabbi, lived in Germany. Uh, he died in 1217. He uh, was, uh, he had an academy where he trained many, many young Jewish scholars. Uh, he has been studied and quoted by Jewish scholars through the ages. He was called the light of Israel. Um, and he said, that the prophet Elijah appeared to him. Now this is a very reputable man. You can look him up on Wikipedia or whatever. Very reputable man. And he said that the prophet Elijah appeared to him and told him what was gonna happen in the future. So he documented this. He left this prophecy at his death. And he said, don't open this until after I die. So he wrote this prophecy at his death in 1217 
the prophecy was opened and read, and here's what it said. And let's say this, think about it, exactly 800 years ago. Exactly. Because we're now at 27. That's very significant. That, that's amazing. That's very significant. When the Ottoman Turks conquered Jerusalem, this is his prophecy. When the Ottoman Turks conquer Jerusalem, they will rule over Jerusalem for eight jubilees. And that's 50 years. The jubilee is 50 years. Afterwards, Jer Jerusalem will become a no man's land for one jubilee. And then in the ninth jubilee, it will once again come in back into the possession of the Jewish nation, which would signify the beginning of the Messianic end time. Wow. So he's in the year 1217, and he's saying here, Elijah came to me, Elijah the prophet. He said, Elijah the prophet who precedes the Messiah. Remember the two witnesses now? Yes. Okay, that's Elijah and Enoch. And so he said, Elijah came to me and told me what was going to happen in the end. And he said, when the Ottoman Turks conquer Jerusalem, they'll rule it for eight jubilees. Well, the Ottoman Turks defeated the Ma Mamluks in 1517, 300 years after his death, the Ottoman Turks overcame the Mamluks and they conquered Jerusalem and they ruled it until 1917. That is 400 years, exactly eight jubilees. Because the jubilee is 50. Right. So eight times 50 would be 400, right. so exactly 400 years, just like the prophecy exactly. that Judah ben Samuel received from the prophet Elijah. Oh then, my goodness. Then in 1917, okay, um, the, uh, the, the, uh, the League of Nations uh, conferred the British mandate upon uh, the mandate to rule Jerusalem to the British. And General Allenby came into Jerusalem and liberated it from the Ottomans in the year 1917. And so remember the, the prophecy was Jerusalem will be a no man's land in the ninth Jubilee. It literally, legally was a no man's land. It was not given to the Jews or the Arabs. And so when Israel became a nation in 1948, there was a war over Jerusalem. And the Jews took West Jerusalem, the Jordanians took East Jerusalem, and there was a strip of land in the middle called the no man's land. Just like the prophecy. Just like the prophecy until 1967, exactly one jubilee later, when in 1967 there was a six day war and the Jews took the city of Jerusalem. All right, so think about that. From 1917 to 1967, 50 years, exactly one jubilee, which was what the prophecy that Elijah gave to Judah years and early. Samuel. Okay. Oh, so, then, so then here is... There's now, no way that can just be coincidence. Well, then he says in the 10th jubilee, it will be the beginning of the messianic end times. Well, guess what? This is 1917. This is the 50th year since the beginning of the 10th Jubilee. His word was given in Jubilees, which is very significant. Okay, so this is 2017. 2017. And so 50 years, an exact Jubilee, since Jerusalem was reunited east and west and they got rid of the no man's land. 1967, that's exactly right. So in 1217, he gives a prophecy that includes 10 Jubilees. And he's saying the ninth one, there'll be a no man's land. The first through the eighth one, there's going to be the Ottomans are going to rule Jerusalem. But the tenth one is going to begin, the beginning of the tenth jubilee is going to be the messianic end times. In other words, the return of the Messiah. Wow. This is 2017, the end of his prophecy. We are at the end of Judah ben Samuel's prophecy. By the way, his name means praise the son of God. Judah ben Samuel, wow. Judah means praise, Ben means son of, and Samuel means his name is God, or his name is El. So his name means praise the son of God. Now think of the significance of that. And the other thing I love about his word is it's given in Jubilee. See, the Jews have basically lost the knowledge of exactly when the Jubilee year is. But let me say something for just a minute, very significant now. I'm not trying to get spooky, but you really need to listen to what I'm about to say. So a year of Jubilee, is there were seven sevens of years. Uh, God said there's a Sabbath of years, rest on the seventh year. But when there's been seven Sabbaths, 49 years, the 50th year is your year of Jubilee. Well, in the year of Jubilee, all debt was remitted. And in the year of Jubilee, 
all land reverted to its original owner. In 1917, Judah ben Samuel says this word is going to be given in, in, uh, in Jubilees. In 1917, the Jews all over the world were allowed to come to Palestine for the first time in 2,000 years. So in other words, the land began to revert to its original owners, the Jews, in 1917. Then one jubilee later, the city of Jerusalem reverts back to its original owner, the Jews. We're 50 years later. Could it be that in 2017, the Temple Mount goes back to the Jews? Incredible. In other words, a, a jubilee year is when the land goes back to its original owner. The Jews are the original owners of this land. And so the, the, word, the word verifies itself, not just in history, but also in what has happened to the land of Israel. But I've said before on another program, there's going to be a rebuilt temple. In Revelation 11, we are told, John says, you go measure the temple mount, but not the outer court, because it's been given to the Gentiles. That gold dome that we see back there is the dome of the rock. That's the Gentiles. That's the Muslims. And so there's going to be a rebuilt temple over here, and we know that the Antichrist is going to desecrate it in the middle of the tribulation. But that, that temple mount has to go back to the Jews at some point, and there's a tremendous amount of activity right now regarding the temple mount. In fact, there was a shooting of two Israeli policemen, and the Jewish uh, police took the temple mount by force for a few days. That's the first time in 2,000 years they've had control of the temple mount. You know, what's so incredible, and I'll be brief about this, just a few days ago, international evangelist Todd White was with us, and he showed footage of him witnessing to th three of those Israeli police at the Lions Gate. And one of those men was who was killed oh, wow. a few days later. And that's what caused Israel then to put in the metal detectors right. and to right. seize control from Jordan, the, the, the Temple Mount. And, and you know, all hell almost broke loose as a result of it. And I want you to know that your day star, we're going to find the family of that man that Todd White witnessed to, and we're going to bless his family. He had four children, so we're going to make a substantial donation to be a blessing to that Israeli policeman. That's fantastic. So we've got to get into the signs in the heaven. <laughs> okay. we, have to, we have to get to that. Okay. I don't want to run out of time. Okay. Well, I want to mention for just a minute, we're going to get to the signs in the heavens. I want to mention just a minute what just happened in America uh, with the solar eclipse. August 21st, we had a solar eclipse that came across the entire continental United States for the first time in 99 years. And a lot of people believe, the Jews believe that a lunar eclipse is a warning to Israel, but a solar eclipse is a warning to the world, to the Gentile nations. So we had a, a solar eclipse that divided America, and some people were saying, well, is that an ominous sign? Okay. I just want to say for just a minute, the last time that we had a solar eclipse like that was in 1918, okay, 99 years ago. In the year 1918, 675,000 Americans died of a flu pandemic, and 50 to 100 million people died worldwide of that flu pandemic. Three to five percent of the world's population died in the year 1918 mm, wow. when that eclipse came through. My That's God. also the year we entered World War I. Yes. We World declared War I. war on Germany in 1917, but John Pershing, or General Pershing, led our troops into the theater of war in 1918. So when you look back at the last time a solar eclipse wow. happened, it was very ominous. The wow. other thing that happened that same week, five days later, was the Houston floods. Now, Jesus said, as it was in the days of Noah, so it will be also in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. So this is a historic flood, and you have Harvey, Hurricane Harvey, and Hurricane Irma. The word Harvey means battle ready, and Irma means goddess of war. Wow. So you have two historic weather events that happen that are both named after war. Now, I want to say something else, and that is uh, as the hurricane was happening in the, the Texas Gulf Coast, um, when you looked at the hurricane coming in, Hurricane Harvey, it looked like the bullseye was on Corpus Christi, Texas. Okay, So that's coming in, and they're trying to project its path and they know that Corpus Christi is about to get hit hard, so it was evacuated. 
and the headline said Corpus Christi, Corpus Christi eerily silent. But then it changed course, and it went more toward the east, more toward Houston, and it hit there and went, went toward Houston, those horrible floods there. So here's, here's an interesting thing. Uh, a historic hurricane is coming, in other words, a flood, and uh, Corpus Christi is evacuated before it hits. Corpus Christi is Latin for the body of Christ. And if you're looking for just a symbol of what's about to happen in the world, if there is a judgment coming in the world, I know there's phenomenal people in Houston. I'm going to speak in Houston. There's great people in Houston. So this is not specific to the people of Houston. It's just, is God speaking to us through things that he's doing? Yes. Well, if he is speaking to us, the picture of what just happened was before a horrible a uh, hurricane hit, the body of Christ was evacuated. Thank God. Okay, so if that is a picture, if it means anything, but what we do know is there has never been a year where two Category 4 hurricanes hit the continental United States. And both wow. Irma and Harvey were historic in the way yes. that they hit, and Harvey and the eclipse happened in the same week. So I think it's, it's worthy to just pay attention to those things and say, God, are you speaking to us? in that. And I'm not sure, again, you know, but it's interesting that you have the two hurricanes named after war that are historic and are hitting the United States. And I wanted to say this, that I made a statement about the eclipse that I didn't know that it was uh, any prophetic sign because I hadn't heard any prophetic voices speaking about it. So I was wrong and I apologize. Please forgive me. Okay. I know Joni is very excited about this, the signs in the heavens. Well, this is a big deal. And I, I, again, I don't want to hype this up, but it, it's a big deal happening with everything else. Uh, Revelation 12 talks about a great sign appeared in the heavens. It's going to appear a week from Saturday. Okay. And, uh, and it's a historic thing. This and is, so this is just like up to date, live. This is about to happen right before our very eyes. Yeah, we're, oh we're going to have the Feast of Trumpets next week. And immediately following, the Feast of Trumpets begins in Israel. Everything in the Bible relates to Israel. So the Feast of Trumpets happens at sundown next Wednesday, okay, a week from now. And it, uh, it uh, stays until sundown Friday, two days. On Saturday, this is going to appear. I want to remind us, Genesis 1, God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of the heavens to divide the day from the night, and let them be for signs, that means signals, okay, and seasons, that means feasts. The word is moed. That's the same word for feast. It means a divine appointment, okay. Let the firmament, let the lights in the firmament be for signs and for seasons and days and years, and let them be for lights in the firmament so the heaven to give light on the earth. Okay, So from the very beginning, God told us he was going to send us signals in the sky. I want to remind us, Jesus was born. The Magi came right over here a couple of miles away to Bethlehem where the star, the heavens, announced the birth of Jesus Christ. Okay, So Luke 21, Jesus said, talking about the end times, the disciples came to Jesus and said, can you tell us when the end is going to be? There will be signs in the sun, the moon, and the stars, and on the earth, distress of nations, check that box, with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, like we see right now, men's hearts failing them for fear and the expectation of those things that are coming on the earth, for the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Yes. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Now, when these things begin to happen, look up and lift up your head, your redemption draws near. I want to remind us of the blood moons that happened in 2014-15. Now, the tetrad of blood moons is where blood moons occur two years in a row on Jewish feasts. It happened in 1492 when the Jews were expelled from Spain. King Ferdinand and Queen Isabella uh, expelled the Jews from Spain. Christopher Columbus was a Jew. And he went to find a safe place for the Jews to live, and that was America. Wow. There were four blood moons in 1492 and 1493 when that was happening. The next time there were four blood moons were in 1949 and 1950 after Israel became a nation. The next time there were four blood moons were in 1967, 1968, the Six-Day War. Mm. The last time that there were blood moons were two years ago, 2014 and 15. You say, well, wait just a minute. In 19... 
1948, Israel became a nation. Then there were blood moons. In 1967, there were the Six-Day War, and during that, there were blood moons. On this case, there were blood moons, but nothing happened. This is the, this is the order of God, the signature of God. The first time it happened afterwards. second time it happened in the middle. The last time it happens before it happens, just like bookends. Mm. So the blood moons happened, and they had to happen according to Joel. Joel says, I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, talking about the end. Blood and fire and pillars of smoke, smoke. the sun shall be turned into darkness, the moon into blood before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. Yes. So the blood moons of 2014 and 15, many people were waiting and saying, well, what, what's going to happen? What's going to happen? Th those had to happen before the Lord could return, according to the book of Joel. So let me go now into the Revelation 12 sign. Now, this is a phenomenal thing. And I've been studying this for several months. There, there are many of you that will be watching this. You haven't seen this before. Go on YouTube. And just type in Revelation 12 sign. All kinds of, of videos there that you can watch. Very informative. This is Revelation chapter 12. And, and again, we, Jesus said there will be signs. Lord, when are you going to come? There's going to be signs in the sun, moon, and stars. Well, we've had a generation of tetrad three uh, the, of the blood moon tetrads that have happened. Revelation 12. A great sign appeared in heaven. A woman clothed with the sun with the moon under her feet, and on her head a garland of twelve stars. Then being with child, she cried out in labor and in pain to give birth, and another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great fiery red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns, and seven diadems on his head. His tail drew a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was ready to give birth to devour her, to devour her child as soon as it was born. She bore a male child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron, and her child was caught up, that's the same word for rapture, caught up to God in his throne. Then the woman fled into the wilderness, where she has a place prepared by God that they should feed her there 1,260 days, three and a half years, the, the three and a half years of the tribulation. So let me, let me talk about this from an astronomical perspective. Now, in Job 38, God is coming to Job, and he's talking to Job. And he talks to Job about Pleiades, Orion, and he says, did you establish the Maseroth in its seasons? That means constellations. The word Maseroth, the 12 signs of the zodiac, come from God. They don't come from astrology. Astrology is a bad thing because astrology assigns some spiritual, ethereal spiritual force to the constellations. And if I'm a Libra, I am a Libra. If I'm a Libra, then everything in my life is controlled, and that's nonsense. Our, my life is controlled by God. Yes. But the 12 constellations are a picture of salvation. I know, Joni, you did a program with Marilyn Hickey. Mm -hmm. And Marilyn Hickey was talking about this. It's called the Masroth. The Jewish rabbis believe in the Masroth. Yeah. And they believe it is a story of God. They don't understand the New Testament aspect of it. But the, the Masroth, the constellations, begin with Virgo, the constellation Virgo. They end with Leo. It begins with a virgin. It ends with a lion. Okay. So this woman, wow. in Revelation 12, it says, I saw a woman clothed with the sun. Well, Virgo always has the sun. That, see, the sun goes through the 12 constellations, each constellation once a year. The moon goes through each constellation once a month. The moon travels much more quickly. So when it says, I saw a woman clothed with the sun, that's telling you it's the fall of the year because the sun is in the constellation Virgo. She was clothed with the sun. The moon was at her feet. Okay? Um, she had a garland of 12 star, stars on. On September the 23rd, which is a week from this coming Saturday, the constellation Virgo has the sun over her shoulder, literally clothed with the sun, the moon is at her feet, and the constellation Leo, Leo is outlined by nine major stars, but next Saturday, Venus, Mercury, and Mars align with Leo to make 12 stars directly over the head of the Virgin. She will literally be crowned with 12 stars, and it says she was giving birth to a male child. Now, this is fascinating. So... Jupiter is the king planet, and the Jews believe that Jupiter is the Messiah. In fact, the Bethlehem star that the Magi followed was probably a convergence of either Jupiter and uh, Venus, which is the day star, the morning star, 
or Regulus, which is also royalty, which is a part of Leo. And, but it was a very bright start. But Jupiter, however you look at it, Jupiter is the king planet. Last November the 20th, the planet Jupiter entered into the womb area of Virgo and stayed there until September 9th, four days ago. 41 weeks, the exact gestation period of a human infant. So the Jupiter entered into the womb area of Virgo, went into retrograde and just stayed. And what retrograde means is the, it appears as though it's standing still or, or not moving much when it actually it is. It's just our perspective. So Jupiter goes into the womb area of Virgo, stays there for 41 weeks. It exited. She gave birth four days ago on September the 9th. Then it says there was a fiery red dragon there to devour the child. Okay. So I've been studying this for three months, and, and this seems fast. It, it seems incredible. I want to encourage you to do something. So be, be, uh, between Virgo's legs, the constellation Virgo's legs right now, there is a red, hideous-looking something there. So I'm, I'm a preacher. I'm talking to you, and you're saying, oh, this preacher's talking about the end times. Go on Google Sky. You'll see this now. Go on Google Sky. When you go on Google Sky, in the bottom left-hand corner, click Constellations. After you click Constellations, over on the right-hand side at the bottom, click Virgo, the constellation Virgo. Then go to the top right-hand corner and click Infrared because it's infrared. And you will see there between Virgo's legs, you're going to see it's blacked out. You're going to see a red, hideous-looking something there that you can only see part of because NASA has redacted. NASA has made Google redact whatever that is between Virgo's legs. But the actual picture of it you can see on a website called Skyview, which is NASA's website, that if you know the coordinates of this, you can type it in. It will show you the actual uh, whatever it is. It is a eerie looking red mass beneath, between Virgo's legs where Jupiter is coming out. Shocking. If you could ever see. So I believe that the woman here represents Israel because we, she gave birth to the church. And we'll try to get those coordinates and put them in over the screen so good, you good. can know where to look it up. Good, good. And the child represents? The child represents the church. Jesus is already in the presence of God. I believe that, that Israel gives birth to the church. We are caught up. And when it says the child rules the nation with a rod of iron, we rule and reign with Jesus for a thousand years on the earth. And then as soon as we're out of here, because it's the same word for rapture in First Thessalonians We're protected 4. from the, the lion, That's the right. red. We've got 30 seconds. Yes. Well, as soon as we're gone, uh, the devil persecutes the, the woman, Israel, and she is chased for 42 months, and she's supernaturally protected by God. But again, this is Bible prophecy, and I just want to say the Revelation 12 sign that hasn't happened for thousands of years, it happens in 10 days. I don't know how to interpret it, but I'm saying this is a time to know Jesus yes. Christ. So that's happening on September 23rd? September 23rd. Ladies and gentlemen, Jesus is coming. Aren't you glad that Jimmy Evans and Daystar are here to tell you about it? Oh, it's so exciting. If you don't know the Lord, call on him today. Jesus is coming soon. We love you. We'll see you again here on Daystar.